My name is Michael Gayed, publisher of the Lead Lag Report. Joining me there is Mr. Richard Duncan. So Richard, introduce yourself to the audience. Who are you? What's your background? Had you interested involved in markets and the economy and technology? And uh, where are you? Michael, thank you for having me back on. Yes, so I have been in the investment industry since 1985. I started my career in Hong Kong when I was 25. Already seen Asia for a few months as a backpacker a few years before that. And it was clear that it was gaming economically. So when I finished business school, I found a job in Hong Kong as a securities analyst. And since then, I've been moving around between Hong Kong, Singapore, and Thailand a few times each as a securities analyst, an economist, a strategist. I eventually became the global head of investment strategy for ABM Amro Asset Management based in London, looking at all the asset classes globally. And I worked for the World Bank for a couple of years in Washington, and I've written four books. The first one was The Dollar Crisis 20 years ago, and the most recent one uh, came out last year. It's called The Money Revolution, How to Finance the Next American Century. And now my main business is a video newsletter called Macro Watch. Every couple of weeks, I upload a new video discussing something important happening in the global economy and how that's likely to impact asset prices. I think it's always interesting to look back at prior work and see if the forecasts or conditions or dynamics played out the one the way that one might think. I'm curious on the dollar crisis, that first book in 2005, as you think back to writing about it in the context of when you were writing about it and where we are today, um, what do you think you got right back then and wrong? And where are we in terms of the dollar and this kind of slow-moving, longer-term crisis? Right. So, yes, the dollar crisis first came out in 2003, and it was updated two years later uh, with a, another 60 pages and a paperback version. And the theme of the dollar crisis was not just that the dollar was going to plunge, but that the world was headed toward a very severe economic breakdown. And the reasoning was uh, I wrote that the U.S. trade deficit was destabilizing the global economy. All the countries with big trade surpluses or overall uh, large surpluses on the balance of payments, all those company, countries blew into bubbles like Japan in the 1980s and Taiwan in the 1980s and a little bit later, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and South Korea. I lived through that. That was the Asian, the Asia crisis. And it blew up in 1997. And that was when I went to work for the World Bank in Washington. And it appeared that this the U.S. trade deficit was just becoming larger and larger. And it was not only causing the trade surplus countries to blow into bubbles, but as those countries accumulated dollars, they reinvested the dollars into the United States. And that was blowing the U.S. into an economic bubble as well. Remember, at the end of the 1990s, we ended up with the NASDAQ bubble. And then not very much longer after that, we had the property bubble in 2007. And that, that property bubble, yet, despite the Fed's best efforts to jack up interest rates and cool the property market down, they, I believe they increased the federal funds rate by 17 times between mid-2004 and mid-2006 uh, to something like 5% federal funds rate. And still, despite that increase in the federal funds rate, the 10-year bond yield didn't go up. And so the mortgage rates didn't go up very much. And the reason they didn't go up is because countries with the trade surpluses like China, their central banks were printing enormous amounts of their own currency buying literally trillions of dollars um, uh, that were flowing into their countries as a result of their trade surpluses with the United States. And once the central banks like the PBOC had accumulated these dollars, they had to pump them back into U.S. dollar-denominated assets like treasury bonds or, or Fannie and Freddie bonds. And so the purchase of literally trillions of dollars of government bonds by foreign central banks pushed up the U.S. bond prices and held down their yields, and that prevented the Fed from reigning in the property bubble. 
So in, indeed, then in 2007, 2008, that bubble did blow up just as I had expected it to in the book, The Dollar Crisis. But where I turned out to be wrong in that book was this uh, crisis of 2008, as severe as it was, didn't lead to a extreme Great Depression, and it didn't cause the dollar standard to collapse. And why didn't it? It didn't because the government policy response was so aggressive. The U.S. government ran trillion-dollar budget deficits to stimulate the economy for four years in a row. And the novel part was the Fed created $3.5 trillion out of thin air over three rounds of quantitative easing. And the trillions of dollars the Fed created, that financed the government borrowing that the government spent to stimulate the economy. I had not imagined that such a thing as quantitative easing on a multi-trillion dollar scale was possible when I wrote The Dollar Crisis in 2002. But afterwards, we saw that it was possible. It was extremely successful because the United States and the global economy didn't collapse into a Great Depression. The dollar standard didn't fall apart. And they managed to do all of that without creating high rates of inflation. The highest rate of inflation that we got after the 2008 crisis, CPI hit 3.8% in 2011. That was it. Inflation peaked at 3.8% in 2011. And by the early months of 2015, there were a few months of deflation where CPI was actually negative. So that's, so that was the theme of the dollar crisis. There would be a global economic financial, economic crisis that would put an end to the dollar standard. That global economic crisis happened, but it didn't put an end to the dollar standard because of quantitative easing. And so that was a lesson uh, that I learned. And afterwards, I've always taken that on board in terms of what does the future hold now? And, and we've seen another uh, round of that again when the COVID pandemic struck. We had massive government. Uh, the government provided stimulus of $5 trillion uh, through multiple rounds of sending out stimulus checks to the individual households as well as corporations. And the Fed financed almost all of that by creating new money taking their total assets up to nearly $9 trillion at the peak sometime early in the middle of last year. Powerful tool of quantitative easing has prevented two great depressions since 2008. And I hadn't foreseen that when I wrote The Dollar Crisis in 2002. And in fairness, even if anybody, even if you, you knew that the Fed would embark on quantitative easing, the reaction nobody would have ever imagined would be the dollar would actually go up relative to other currencies. This is, I think, also what's missed by a lot of people when they look back at QE. It seems obvious. I remember, and I remember this very well because I launched my, my mutual fund in, in literally the day before QE3 started. Back in 2012, everyone was saying that the Fed doing more QE, more QE, more QE meant the death of the dollar and hyperinflation is coming. And the dollar did the exact opposite. It kept on appreciating. Now, there is an argument to be made. I don't know how valid it is, but I want to get your take on it. That uh, while you did not have very high inflation, as you noted, during the era of QE, maybe what we're, we've seen in the last two years, separate from the COVID response, is partially the delayed response of inflation into the system. So you had inflation in asset markets, and then it eventually spilled over into the real economies. It was always there, just not calculated in the way that we tend to think. Is there any validity to the idea that the inflation that we see today is more than just the, the COVID response, that it's the, dec the decade of QE that we went through prior to that? No, I don't think there's any evidence to support that at all. The, we had globalization. Globalization was extremely disinflationary. That's why the inflation rate has been so low since the late 1980s, and that's why interest rates were so low also. So it was globalization putting extreme downward pressure on U.S. wages and on the cost of manufactured goods that was something uh, new because under a gold standard, a country like the United States couldn't have a 
very large trade deficit because that would have sent all of its gold overseas to pay for the trade deficit. And if the country lost a lot of gold, then it's, that was money. Money supply would have contracted, and that would have caused a very severe recession in the U.S. that would have forced the U.S. to stop buying things from other countries. But once the Bretton Woods system broke down, the United States was free to start running these massive trade deficits with the rest of the world. By the mid-'80s, the U.S. trade deficit hit 3.5% of GDP. By 2006, it hit 6% of GDP. That was about $800 billion. And last year, the U.S. current account deficit was almost a trillion dollars. And by buying things from countries with ultra-low wages, that put extreme downward pressure on U.S. prices, and that's why we didn't have any inflation, even after the first three rounds of quantitative easing. Now, a couple of important things changed in the COVID crisis. First of all, everyone was locked, locked down at home, so they couldn't go out and go to restaurants or movies or bars. So they stayed at home, and they all got big stimulus checks. And they took these stimulus checks and they started buying iPads and laptops and jogging machines, mostly from manufacturers in Asia, where all of those things are made. But so that demand stimulated the economy, created more demand for all of these products. And at the same time, though, COVID shut down the factories in Asia and other parts of the world. So there were supply disruptions. And less supply, more demand, that led to a spike in inflation. And just when there was some light at the end of the tunnel that that was going to end, Russia invades Ukraine. And suddenly, one of the world's biggest oil producers and food producers and metal producers, for that matter, was a pariah state. And that caused another big shock. And so what the, the drove up prices in the U.S. and around the world? So what we saw was a partial reversal of globalization because of the global supply chain disruptions and then the war in Russia combined with a domestic U.S. economy that was somewhat overstimulated as a result of all of the stimulus checks the Americans were receiving with no place to spend that money except on buying imported goods, which couldn't be imported easily. So that resulted in a spike in inflation this time Total government stimulus was about $5 trillion. The Fed financed all, almost all of that by creating money. And this time, we did get inflation. Inflation moved up. Uh, it first, first prices fell in the initial months of COVID. But before long, they started increasing. And they, the Fed had hoped that these pressures would be transitory, as they kept saying. But it turned out that transitory was two years rather than one year. Inflation peaked at a very uncomfortable 9% in the middle of last year, and now it's come down to 3%, most recently 3.7%. But 3.7% is not hyperinflation. So you can, we've had much higher rates of inflation than that during this century on numerous occasions. So we've more or less moved through this two-year transitory inflation spike, and we're probably going to move toward even lower rates of inflation before too much longer because it is likely the U.S. will still go into recession uh, before too much longer. So, I, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because I think I always emphasize path matters more than prediction. Last year, everyone was convinced that by this time you'd have a recession. This year, everyone's convinced that uh, there is no recession, or seemingly, right? And the recession is still out there. I mean, the yield curve is clearly telling you that, but when it hits is obviously a whole different issue. Now, I want to bring that to the the latest book, The Money Revolution, because most crises tend to result in revolution. And the Fed certainly has been very creative at preventing creative destruction with the way it uses monetary policy. Lay on the premise of that book. First of all, why did you write it? Lay on the premise for it. And is there anything, it's like a better way of saying it, that could throw off the idea that the government can really kind of finance a lot of the technological innovations and throw money at things that hopefully will be disinflationary? Okay, so in my work for Macro Watch, my video newsletter, uh, 
the main themes that I that I developed in that book, I believe that credit growth drives economic growth in this new era of fiat money. And that liquidity determines the direction of asset prices. The Fed's sorry, sorry, and, and, sorry, to be and to be clear, sorry, and, and by, to be clear that, that's different from this maybe prior way of, of thinking about the economy in terms of it's more driven by productivity. You're saying it's more driven by credit. That's right. Go back, if you will, to the ni- to the nineteenth century. And our economic system was clearly capitalism, for, or at least for the most part. Businessmen would invest, some of them would make a profit. They would accumulate that money as capital, hence capitalism, and repeat, investment saving, investment saving. It was pretty slow and difficult, but that's the way capitalism works. And since the Bretton Woods system broke down, our system has evolved from capitalism into something very different, into a system not driven by investment and savings, but by a system driven by credit creation and consumption, and more credit creation and more consumption. So very rapid credit growth since the Bretton Woods system broke down has become the main driver of economic growth in the United States. So I refer to the, our new system as, as creditism because we, our economic system requires credit growth to stay out of crisis. In between 1952 and 2009, every time total credit grew by less than 2% adjusted for inflation, the U.S. went into recession. That happened nine times. And each time we went into recession and the recession didn't end until there was another big surge of credit creation. So that's, uh, those are the themes of MacroWatch. Credit creation drives economic growth. Liquidity drives asset prices. If the Fed's printing a lot of money, asset prices tend to go up. If the Fed's destroying money, asset prices tend to go down with a little bit of a lag. And so I focus very much in my work on looking at the Fed and looking at credit. So I wrote this book to answer your question because I first, there are three parts. First part is a history of the Fed from the time it was created in 1913. It's a history of the Fed. It tells the history of the Fed in a very unique and precise way by analyzing the changes in the Fed's balance sheet. Changes on the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet show you precisely how the Fed created money. And changes on the asset side of the balance sheet show you precisely what the Fed did with the money it created. So I traced that from 1914 up until the time the book came out, 2021, 2022. So the first first part is the history of the Fed. The second part is the history of credit over over the last 110 years. And the evolution of our economic system from credit, from capitalism into creditism, showing that credit growth became, for instance, around 1950, the ratio of total credit to GDP in the U.S. was around 130%. By 1980, that had increased to 170%. And by 2008, that had increased to 370%. To GDP, credit to GDP or debt to GDP, the same thing. And so as credit expanded more rapidly than the rest of the economy, that became the fuel that made the economy grow. And the problem is in 2008, the private sector became so heavily indebted that they couldn't even repay the interest on their, on their mortgages and other debt that they'd taken out. And credit started to cor- collapse. The U.S. started to collapse into a 1930s-style Great Depression with all the banks starting to fail. And luckily, the authorities, the Treasury Department and the Fed, had learned the lessons from the Great Depression. And they didn't let market forces work. They didn't let the banks fail. They didn't allow the creative destruction. Instead, they provided so much stimulus through government debt and spending, financed Fed money creation, that it reflated the bubble and avoided the Great Depression Part Two, which would have involved at least a decade of misery, potentially leading to horrible geopolitical consequences like the Great Depression did. And so they, that worked. They reflated the economy, didn't cause any inflation to speak of. And so not surprisingly, when COVID struck and when the decision was made to lock everyone down at home, 
And by the way, that wasn't just in the United States, but that decision was made almost in every country all around the world. Then had the government not provided the stimulus checks, it wouldn't have taken long before our banking system would have collapsed. Because of course, if the people are locked at home and can't work and they can't earn money, and they're not going to have any money to pay interest on their mortgages or their car loans or their credit cards. So non-performing loans would skyrocket. And before you know it, the banks would all fail. And so that they would have been, again, a replay of the 1930s depression. So since 2008, since that policy response had been so successful, they did it again with $5 trillion worth of stimulus financed with another $5 trillion of money creation by the Fed. And again, we didn't collapse into a Great Depression. We didn't have a systemic financial sector collapse. J.P. Morgan didn't fail. Our economy now is, is considerably larger than it was before COVID started. And so we've come through this really quite well relative to what would have occurred otherwise. The only negative side effect was we had two years of transitory inflation which is now behind us. Some, some would argue that it's not behind us because of structural uh, underinvestment in oil, net gas, and energy in general. You can argue that the latest concerns are because oil is rising and cost push inflation for the commodity side. Is there any validity from your view on that, on that idea that maybe inflation could reaccelerate if commodities reaccelerate? Sure, of course it could. If, for instance, the Russia's in decides to invade Poland and Germany, and there's a world war, then they're going to have extremely high rates of inflation. And the government would it would have to impose price controls. There are certainly scenarios in which inflation could spike again. If China invades Taiwan, the United States is not going to allow that to happen. Because as we're now seeing on the, the, the this AI revolution, AI is running on NVIDIA's processors, and NVIDIA's processors are made in Taiwan. And so if China gets Taiwan and gets NVIDIA's H100s, then they're going to dominate artificial intelligence, and they will control the, the, the world. And yes, there are scenarios of there is a war. Yes, we'll have very high rates of inflation again. COVID suddenly reemerges and we go through another bout of lockdowns and yes, we'd have more inflation again. But assume, hoping for the best and which is, you know, I think, I think there's, I don't think there's the Ukraine war is going to spread into Europe and I don't think China's learned the lesson from Russia's failure to take over Ukraine. I don't think they're going to try to take Taiwan anytime soon because it would be so catastrophic for their economy and their political system. So I don't think those things are going to happen. And hopefully there won't be any more serious rounds of COVID. And I think we're going to be more or less back where we were before COVID started with a generalized, generally globalized economy, putting downward pressure on the, on wages and the cost of manufactured goods, resulting in low rates of inflation, essentially taking us back to where we were before COVID started. Go back to the credit versus productivity framework, I'm going to assume that a credit-based system resulted in a much wider uh, wealth gap than a productivity-based one. Any thoughts on how the wealth gap could maybe become a, a, a bigger and bigger problem? Arguably, there's always a wealth gap in quasi-capitalist systems. I mean, it's the Pareto principle is a fairly consistent phenomenon in almost all domains, but you don't want it to get to be too wide because if a wealth gap is too wide because it's a credit-based system, if that's a cause, uh, that inevitably creates real social distortions. Of course, the Gilded Age was at the end of the 19th century when capitalism was at its peak. So I wouldn't attribute uh, this widening wealth gap just to uh, creditism. In fact, while the gap is very wide again, as wide as it was the older age, if you look at it differently, creditism has resulted in phenomenally rapid global economic growth during the last three to four decades. Literally hundreds of millions of people have been pulled out of poverty all around the world, and it's resulted in a lot of great things happening. For example, during the Reagan era, when this creditism really 
went into hyperdrive. President Reagan had the U.S. government invest in the U.S. military so aggressively that uh, it essentially bankrupted the Soviet Union because they couldn't compete. So a few years after Reagan left office, the Soviet Union collapsed. That was a direct result, I would say, of credit in them. Okay, U.S. government debt tripled under President Reagan, but the U.S. economy boomed. We didn't have any sort of economic catastrophe as a result of the tripling of government debt under President Reagan. And we got all kinds of benefits in addition to a booming economy, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and all the Asian countries prospered. When I first got to Asia, these countries were growing at 10% a year. So there have been many benefits from this shift from, from capitalism to creditism. The problem with creditism is that it really must have credit growth to survive. And if credit begins to contract, there will be a Great Depression. And that's why the government keeps intervening every time it does start, every time credit does start to correct. Correct. The government has to jump in and take on more government debt. Right now, the ratio of U.S. government debt to GDP is about 100, a little bit less than 125% of GDP. That's larger than it's ever been, uh, more or less. But Japan's government debt to GDP is 260%. So it's well over twice as high as U.S. government debt to GDP. Japan's government debt to GDP is where the U.S. government debt to GDP is now. Japan was there about 22 years ago. So this is not like we are have so much government debt that we can't continue with this system for decades to come. And that brings me to the third part of the book. You were asking about the book. First part was a history of the Fed. The second part was a history of credit and the evolution of our economy from capitalism into creditism. The third part of the book is about the future. What can we learn from this history of the evolution of of the Fed and money into credit, what can we learn from this history that we've lived through? I believe what we should learn is that the U.S. government actually could very easily afford to finance a very, very large investment in new indus- in the industries and technologies of the future, such as quantum computing, artificial intelligence, nanotech, robotics, neurosciences, green energy, and so on. And that is, the, that is the third part of the book. And indeed, that is the theme of the book, that it would be really easy for the U.S. government to finance over the next decade on a multi-trillion dollar scale an investment so large in future industries and technologies that it would absolutely turbocharge U.S. economic growth. We could stop thinking about 1% or 2% GDP growth a year and start thinking about 5 or 7% GDP growth a year like we had at the peak of the Reagan investment, government investment boom. And these sorts of investments would result in such extraordinary technological breakthroughs that it would turbocharge economic growth. And these breakthroughs in medicine and all in energy, for instance, these sorts of investments would probably yield things like cheap, Fusion. Cheap fusion would solve all of our problems. A cancer cure, an, uh, an Alzheimer's cure. These are the sorts of things that we would get if the government were to finance a multi-trillion dollar investment in new industries and technologies over the next decade. Now, multi-trillion sounds like a lot of money, but uh, let me put that into perspective. In the second quarter of 2020, the first quarter of COVID, U.S. government debt in three months, increased by almost $3 trillion. And the Fed created roughly the same amount over the, roughly the same period of time. So we're talking about $3 trillion expansion of government debt and the Fed's total assets in 90 days. That, okay, that led, that contributed against a background of global supply chain bottlenecks and a very serious war that gave us transitory inflation that peaked at 9%. Now we're back below 4%. I'm not talking about investing $3 trillion over 90 days. I'm going to talk, I'll settle for $3 trillion over five years and would like to have $10 trillion over 10 years. We could so easily afford to do that. And it would transform. It would so radically 
enhance human well-being. And also, very importantly, it would shore up U.S. national security, which is now under threat from the rise of China. And lately, people are beginning to think China's great economic boom has peaked, and maybe it has. But the fact is, at the moment, they are investing more in research and development than the United States is. And if they get ahead of us in terms of artificial intelligence in particular, then they will rule the world. Our national security is by no means guaranteed. You can see how rapidly this artificial intelligence revolution is accelerating. And we have to win it. And we can win it by the government financing large investments in artificial intelligence and quantum computing and the other industries of the future. So that is what the book was all about. When we spoke 15 months ago, um, the high rates of inflation were really under, undermining this theme. It's funny, my first book came out, as we've said, in 2003, the dollar crisis. It had perfect. After it came out, the dollar just fell and fell and fell and fell, and the book did very well. This book, sadly, has been just the opposite. My book is arg arguing that the government could easily finance a very large-scale investment in new industries and technologies without causing inflation. No sooner is the book out than we have high rates of inflation. But now the inflation's gone. And so I, before book is entirely forgotten, I would like to raise this point again. And I was very fortunate. In fact, it was a dream come true. I was invited by a member of Congress on the House Ways and Means Committee to present the ideas in my book to 15 members of the House Ways and Means Committee in Washington in February this year. And so uh, I did that. And um, so at least, at least I had a, a chance to present this idea to, to important policymakers. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope we'll see, I hope that will result in and something positive happening for our country and the, and the world. And it's also interesting, since we spoke, other good things have happened. Inflation was a very bad thing for my book. But on the other hand, the Chips and Science Act was passed in August last year. And the Chips and Science Act is really right along the lines of what the book calls for. $280 billion to be invested in, new, in, the, in the new industries and technologies that I mentioned earlier with $50 billion allocated for the development of semiconductor manufacturing facilities in the United States, in Ohio, in Texas, Arizona, and other parts of the country, which are now being built. These factories are being built. And with the rest of the money, the rest of the $280 billion going into investments in other new industries and technologies like quantum computing, robotics, neurosciences, etc., so that was a very big step in the right direction. And it's so clear now how desperately we, we need these manufacturing, semiconductor manufacturing facilities in the United States because China is threatening Taiwan. Taiwan makes the NVIDIA's chips and we have to make them in the United States. And that's what the Chips and Science Act is going to make happen. But my only problem with the Chips and Science Act is that it's, it's far too small. It's $280 billion. As I mentioned earlier, in the, in the second quarter of 2020, U.S. government debt increased by $2.8 trillion. That's, 10, that's enough to finance the Chips and Science Act 10 times over. So what I said to the Congress people that I spoke with is that, yeah, well done. That was a very, Chips and Science Act was very important, and we, we're now understanding how important the Inflation Reduction Act also was in terms of bringing money into being invested, investing money, new money, U.S. money, and also foreign money is being invested in uh, clean energy pro projects of all kinds with estimates ranging of more than a, a trillion dollars of new investments that will result from the Inflation Reduction Act alone. So those are great, but they're just not large enough. We need to be thinking in the trillions of dollars, not in the hundreds of billions, because China's thinking in terms of trillions of dollars of investment in new industries and technologies. And they are, in the year 2000, 
the United States invested eight times more in research and development than China did. By 2017, only 10% more. By 2020, China overtook us in in R&D investment. And if current growth rates continue for R&D investment in both countries, within 10 years, they will invest in that 10th year they'll invest 40% more than the United States in R&D. And if they do, they will become the undisputed global superpower. They will surpass us in all respects, economically, technologically, and therefore militarily. And we will no longer enjoy national security. There are so many fear mongers uh, on the internet uh, preaching that the the dollar is doomed. This, This is not new. I've been listening to these people for 20 years and was myself 20 years ago one of them. But the dollar standard is is going to continue to be the dominant international monetary system. And here's why. The reason the world is on a dollar standard is because the United States has such an enormous trade deficit with the rest of the world. Last year, the U.S. current account deficit was almost $1 trillion. And since Bretton Woods broke down in 1971, the cumulative U.S. trade deficit has been $14 trillion, with all of, almost all of that coming since the year 2000. So this has thrown out $14 trillion into the global economy, $1 trillion of them last year. And it might not be a trillion this year, but it'll be $800 billion or more. So at the end of this year, there are going to be $800 billion more in the global economy than there were last year. So take China, for example. China talks that it says it would like to have a different kind of international monetary system, but they're completely reliant on the U.S. dollar standard. China's trade surplus with the U.S. is nearly $400 billion, and it has been like that for about five years now. So we can say a billion, let's call it a billion dollars a day. China's exporters sell their goods in the United States. They get paid in dollars. They take those dollars back to China. And China accumulates those dollars, and then once it has the dollars, if it wants to earn any interest on them, and of course it does, it has to buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets, like government bonds or Fannie and Freddie bonds. Now, you may be thinking, okay, they don't have to. They could sell some of those dollars and buy euros. But whoever they bought the euros from, then those people would have the dollars, and they would have to buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets. Or China could buy some gold. But whoever they bought the gold from, those people would have dollars, and they would have to buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets. And if we had a different kind of economic monetary system, global monetary system, that didn't allow the U.S. to sell things to China in exchange for dollars, for instance, if we went back to some sort of gold standard, and the U.S. actually had to pay for its trade deficit with gold, the U.S. would run out of every ounce of gold in the United States within about a month. After that time, it would not be able to buy one more pair of tennis shoes from China. Therefore, China's economy would collapse and its political system would collapse and there would probably be starvation, not only in China, but in other exporters to the United States. So that would be a complete disaster. That's why we're on a dollar standard. And if if China wants to make a bunch of loans to Argentina that Argentina has no plans of ever repaying to China, China should feel free to do that. But it's not going to be fine. If China wants to pay for Russian oil, then they can pay in yuan, and China will end up with a bunch of yuan. But it's still not going to change the fact that at the end of this year, there'll be $800 billion more dollars in the global economy than there was at the beginning of this year. That's why we're on a dollar standard. That's why we're going to continue to be on a dollar standard for the foreseeable future, by which I mean decades. And uh, that's just not going to change. And the dollar standard has been great for the global economy. As I've said, I've watched Asia industrialize as a direct result. I was recently in Vietnam. Vietnam is booming economically. Their trade surplus with the United States last year was nearly $120 billion. Can you imagine what $120 billion going into a country like Vietnam can do to to the economy? It's it's completely transformative, just like it transformed Taiwan and South Korea and Thailand and Malaysia and all the other countries that have followed export-led growth, exporting to the United States. So this dollar standard 
Don't think in terms of how the IMF is going to lend money to these countries. The benefit of the dollar standard is that we allow all these countries to have, or many countries, most countries around the world to have big trade surpluses with the U.S., and that's how we promote their economic development. And furthermore, I mean, the Americans should not forget we are the good guys. We, we have not always been flawless in our policies, but if you look since the end of World War II, first of all, we, we won the war. And then afterwards, over time, we had a nuclear monopoly for a few years. Did we try to take over the world? No, we didn't. And then the Soviet Union took over Eastern Europe and gradually through bad, through steady support and determination, we eventually drove the Soviet Union out of Eastern Europe and all of those countries got their freedom. And I saw East Berlin before the wall came down. It was not a place you'd like to live. It was very frightening. There were machine guns and there were more machine guns than there were uh, pieces of fruit to buy in the grocery store. There was, was no fruit, but there were lots of machine guns in not only East Berlin, but in Prague. And we don't want to live in a totalitarian state. So it's easy to criticize the United States and point out all the bad things we've done and some People argue that we're responsible for Russia invading Ukraine. All that is bullshit. And um, Americans need to recognize that we're the good guys and have faith in our, in our own country. Because this 70 plus years since the end of World War II, which the United States has played the leadership role in, 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 the, in the world, has been the most prosperous in the history of mankind. And we want that to continue. And we want to continue to be the leaders of this world because the alternatives, China and or, and or Russia or some combination, would eliminate everything we hold dear. And so the way to avoid that from happening is to follow the cue, of, for instance, of President Reagan, who realized that the Soviet Union was gaining ground all around the world in Angola, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, and he built up the U.S. military. He had the U.S. government invest in the U.S. military. And that investment has been paying dividends ever since. And now we need to invest again very aggressively, learning the lessons from Reagan. I'm confused. The Republican Party, the most successful policy of the Republican Party during my lifetime was that of President Reagan investing in the U.S. military very aggressively and extraordinarily successfully with enormous benefits in every respect. But now, rather than following his example and having the U.S. invest more, they're insisting on austerity. They want the government to spend less, which can only lead to decades of stagnation and national shame as we're overtaken by China in, in every sphere. So they should reconsider their austerity policy and instead uh, return to a Reagan era and have our government invest in new industries and technologies. And if I may, I would propose not that the U.S. government make these investments directly itself, but that the government finance the investment and set up joint ventures with, let's say, for instance, the 10,000 most promising American scientists and entrepreneurs. So that joint venture companies with the U.S. government financing these companies lavishly in, and in exchange keeping a 60% equity stake and let the entrepreneurs and the scientists manage these companies and keep a 40% equity stake. And when these companies start, one of them invents cheap fusion, then this company is worth trillions of dollars and the whole program pays for itself many times over. And the U.S. government, i.e. the American taxpayers, keep 60% of all the profits. So, so it, the thing would pay for itself in short order and radically enhance human well-being. So that is, that is the idea behind the book, and that is what I believe. Yes, thanks for the question. Yes, I do think that's going to happen. We're seeing it beginning to happen. Uh, companies are no longer investing in China. They're all diversifying into Vietnam and India and Mexico and in the United States itself, thanks to the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. It's going to take some time, though. These 
factories, these semiconductor fabs are not going to be built this year. Some of them may be completed there by the end of next year or the year after that. It's going to take some time. And meanwhile, we're going to continue buying things from China and China's going to keep selling things to the US because they have no choice. Their economy depends on it. Yes, just shifting a bit. Please do follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Paper Money Econ. And also, I hope you'll check out my, my website, which is richardduncaneconomics.com. And take a look at my video newsletter, Macro Watch. If you would like to subscribe to Mac- Macro Watch, you can subscribe at a 50% discount if you use the discount coupon code SPACES. So go to richardduncaneconomics.com. Take a look. You can sign up for the free blog, or you can subscribe to Macro Watch at a 50% discount if you use the discount coupon code SPACES. Everybody, please give a follow to Richard Duncan. Special thanks to Tara for the question. Piotr, as always, and hopefully I will see you all in literally three minutes when I've got the Carson Block or a can't miss conversation. You will see that very, very shortly. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Richard. Again, this will be an edited podcast soon enough. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, everybody.